Okay. Hey there, star <laughs> watchers. We are on board the five talking heads for this Monday, the um, 12th through the Sunday 18th for a week. It's the weekly blog podcast for Santa Barbara, California's longtime astronomy and telescope club, the beloved Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. We call it the SBAU Astro Hour. Heard every Monday morning, 11 o'clock to noon on YouTube. You can watch. We're only 20 seconds behind. That's faster than uh, light from Betelgeuse. Now into our third year of kicking around the cosmos on Zoom. And this is episode number 121, well into our third year. Uh, I'm your host, Ron Heron, proud to be vice president now, going on five or six years of SBAU, proud to be serving with some of the most knowledgeable and easygoing gentlemen I've ever known. Go on sbau.org and check us out. And this week, we are going to delve into the moon, of course, again, probably the most watched item in the sky. It's fourth quarter this week. Saturn's moons can be seen, mostly uh, to the east of it, I think. And we'll get into Venus, where it is. It's become a drone out there in a beehive cluster, and <laughs> temporarily. And I'm wondering if in the center of a beehive cluster, the queen bee is a... Um, supermassive black you know what volcanoes are on four other worlds ladies and gentlemen in our solar system beyond us can you believe that two of them are planets two of them <clears throat> unless you count us we'd make three there's a moon out there somewhere and an asteroid the summer triangle is rising in the east lots of variable stars to cover this week including a rare one it's only about 150 in the whole galaxy that we've uncovered and the double ring galaxy m94 plus categorizing exoplanets the stellar systems they've got, got enough of them and we're also going to have some silly stuff once i introduce you to the man behind those who forwards them to us our science cartoons from president jerry wilson how are you jerry good morning good morning turning uh let's call it 79 trips around the sun very shortly his wife is pat forgy Seven years, six years, how many years? We Nobody wants our job, so that's fine with me. <laughs> uh, here's Chuck McPartland, our incredible outreach coordinator, in front of the flag of uh, Ukraine. His wife is our merchandise manager, Pat McPartland, and together they make up an incredible team of secretaries. Already, I think we've got something from Saturday's meeting online. Uh, we have, uh, joining us early, Bruce Murdoch. Hello. Active member, Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. And I, if I had more time to talk to you, I'd get, well, just quickly, what, what's something we can go to involving organs and uh, the we Arlington? We just had an open console on last Saturday. And the next okay, one will be so, next time. Well, I just, saw, I just saw a news piece or a feature story about a lady playing alone in Albert Hall in London. And the whole damn hall is nothing but pipes. It was just awesome Bach. I wish you'd seen that. And Doug got it. And well, incidentally, he's married to um, Bonnie. And uh, Tom Whittemore, who's on the screen, former science instructor out at Westmont, is married to Maureen. How are you, Tom? Fine. Thank you. Morning. Pungent smell of sourdough bread in your oven this morning. Got a good nose. <laughs> that smell of vision, huh? I don't understand nature. I really don't. It gives us that great smell, that great taste, and yet it's not that great for us. You know, it's all carbs. Nevertheless, we're going to talk funny stuff now. These are silly science cartoons, and there's a bunch of them. I assume Mr. President, who sends them to us, finds them somewhere, is going to select the better ones. And I've written little things that kind of go along with them as they come on the screen. You folks watching? Let's start with a little levity. Which one is going to be first? Oh, I like this one. <laughs> All right. Well, explain it to me. What is that? Um... Well, that's Avogadro's number, but they're making an avocado, Avocado's number. Oh, Avogadro. Okay. I, all right. This is how molecules this... in a mole of a of, of a um, of a of an element. Yes. I'm sorry. What did you say? Oh, what how? A mole, that's its molecular weight in grams, and if it's a gas, the standard temperature pressure is 22.5 liters. That's an X between the two. Liters. That's, an right. X, that's not a formula, though. That's not a uh, equation. No, it's a number. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms. atoms per mole. A mole so is the molecular weight in grams of the particular uh, element. What, so what? Hydrogen is molecular weight is just over one 
uh, uh, Graham. Yeah. Inquiry can you imagine? Back. Can you imagine the tweezers and the patience he had? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, something like avocado, and his name is Alva Gadros. Alva Gadro. Yeah. All right. Look him up. I'm. It's all new to me. I'm learning. It's huh? a. It's a natural mnemonic. And he he was a mathematician, obviously. No, he was a chemist. Yeah. Chemist. Yeah. And that's the number of atoms in whatever we're looking at here. Interesting. The standard volume of uh, of the material. It's either if it's a, a solid, it's a, the molecular weight in grams. Okay. And if it's a gas, it's a uh, uh, twenty two point four liters at standard temperature and pressure. Wow. Well, that's the sort of stuff that impresses me. But what kind of avocado is that? Is that a Haas? Uh, <laughs> Haas. I, no. I have no but idea. Gary Larson at his best as the family gets sucked out of their apartment. Suddenly, through forces not yet fully understood, Darren Belsky's apartment became the center of a new black hole. Oh, my God. That's what it's like. Passing the uh, singularity. Uh, here we are sitting down to breakfast with a bunch of uh, extraterrestrials. And once yeah, again, I like this. Yeah. Crop circles. Mystery solved. Yeah. That that was the next panel, right? Isn't there a thing with crop circles no, showing? No, this is it. But oh, they man. also did wheat wheat fields. Well, there it is. Crop, uh, crop circles. I see at the bottom there. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't always corn. But that's all right. Corn did pretty well on Broadway last night. I yeah. don't know if you saw the Tonys. There's a whole. And the thought occurred to me that bread is why we have been able to form a civilization. Yeah, you're probably right. Before that, nature didn't have a way to process that carb. So now our bodies. Just... Well, we we developed a way to process it. I know that. Yeah, I, I grew up. It allowed with... us to settle down and stop roving. Here's Calvin and Hobbes, and uh, Calvin's the kid, right? He says yeah. to his friend Hobbes, the uh, tiger. You know, here's another math problem. I can't figure out what's nine plus four. Ooh, says uh, Hobbes, that's a tricky one. You got to use calculus and imaginary numbers for this. The kid suddenly freaks out imaginary numbers well see you know 11 teen, 30 12 and all those it's a little confusing at first well how did you learn all this Hobbes you've never even gone to school and uh, Tiger says instinct Tigers are born with it okay good, <laughs> good at imaginary number is pi as we've discussed before right and here that's are the, not an imaginary that's, number that's, that's an irrational number irrational number, number. Just, just an irrational number oh, okay imaginary is uh, minus something uh, never mind square root here we no, go the uh, the extraterrestrials got himself into a trouble we've all experienced well i actually well, the in there <laughs> stalled alien ship uh <laughs> Here they come. Uh, you lock the damn keys inside, so you do the talking, okay? Mork or orc or whatever. <laughs> Here they come. Ah, that, I like this. The uh, ellipses. You have the lunar eclipse, the solar eclipse, and the apocalypse, plus alpaca has got lips. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll spit at you, too. I got it. It will. Yeah. All right, this is great. The guy's uh, buying a book and the lady's taking advantage <laughs> of the title. Right. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Two math for dummies, $16.99 each. That'll be $50, please. Thank you. <laughs> and he probably pays it. All right, make that larger. Okay. Teacher's talking to the parents. So it turns out Billy is failing math because <laughs> someone at home keeps telling him 40 is the new 30, gentlemen. <laughs> who are now 60s, the new 60s. Here's a race between five scientists. The physicist has a little bit of an advantage <laughs> using <laughs> physics. What would the other guys do? Yeah, okay, that's good. Big rubber band. And this guy's peeing behind the rock. And, and this is from Star Trek, right? Yeah. Right. Yes, Jim. <laughs> yes, Jim, we get it. Now you can say, you can stop going where no man has ever gone before. <laughs> okay and you notice the guy in the back there is stepping in a puddle yeah probably, oh there. yeah oh that's probably okay well go to the all right if you were to get a time machine made and could go back to the jurassic era the first thing you'd want to do is uh, take a temperature of a dinosaur right <laughs> well let's see i wrote this down uh leaving the cold-blooded uh, the, oh here it is this is typical far side Gary Larson. An instant later, both Professor Waxman and his time machine were obliterated, wearing <laughs> leaving, 
leaving the cold-blooded versus warm-blooded dinosaur debate still unsolved. <laughs> so that's kind of a nasty way to go. Back. <laughs> Spell this guy's yes. name again. Uh, sounds like avocado. I, I got to look him up when I get off. Avogadro. Avogadro. That's all. Avogadro. 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 Okay. 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 All right. Got it. Lots to talk about, and it's mostly uh, variable stars. We've really gotten into variable stars, not really much on uh, star clusters this week. We'll start with the old moon if you want. Yep, it is what? Third quarter, fourth quarter. We're going into it's double not overtime. That sharp. I'm going to blow it up. This is what the moon will look like tonight. Um, it's past f uh, last quarter. And at last quarter, it rises at midnight. So this is going to rise about 2 a.m. or so. Um, the Just past the crater Copernicus, you can see right here. But there are um, seas and a lot of things to see at this crescent moon, which will be hanging in the morning sky before sunrise. And by the end of the week, we'll be either at or approaching new moon. This is the um, time when we get up till about from sunset to 2 a.m., we get nice dark slices of time. And so that's when we can start looking at and photographing faint fuzzies. This and for the next two weeks. And all those spots and names of the right are in the dark, but we'll see. These, are, these are names there, um, just the grossest features, the mare. Well, I was Ocean talking about the right in the dark. Yeah. 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 This part you won't see. Right. Well, what did you highlight here? Uh, Mari Imbrium, bordered on the yeah. south by Apennine Mountains. Can you can we see those? Do we have a close? This is Mar in Mar in whatever you said. Imbrium. Imbrium. Procellarum. Uh, they have. A, I actually have a mountain range named on the moon. Yes, the Apennines. There's a number of them. Really? And the word mons means mountain. There's a lot of individual mountains and um, rises or swellings in the lava in the surface that are called mons. And Copernicus has a crater named after him in that vicinity. Yeah, one of the prominent craters. Okay. Mons is uh, popular throughout the whole solar system, except for here where it's mountains on our planet. Everything else is mons. It depends what language you speak. Yeah. Well, Mars has Olympus mons. Yeah. And there's other anything. Okay, whatever the language. We'll get to those. If All if right. your language if you speak the right language here, it's Mons here too. Are, are we looking for Saturn and its moons here? No, Not this at this time. This right here, we're looking at um Venus. Oh in, Venus. Um, Beehive. Yeah, this is um Beehive cluster. Oh no, this is Mars and Venus is right. The uh, for some reason, these pictures are not as sharp as they usually are. This is the word Venus right here, and this white dot is Venus, and this blob down in here is the beehive cluster, and this is Mars over here. Uh, I'm not sure that can't, uh, Saturn would not be here, just Mars and Venus. A while ago, Mars was passing through Cancer, it's moved on now, and Venus, the evening star, is now in Cancer. <laughs> Going are, they both, both, are they both going the same direction? They, the yes. Okay, they're both heading left, which is, how do, how does that translate west or east in That's situation? that's east. That's east. And and down there on the lower left is Regulus. The uh, um, bright well that, oh. that seems to be displaced. To, oh no, that's the front leg. Okay, so Regulus yeah. is over there just off the side. And both of those, both Mars and Venus are going to be close to, there's Regulus, close to Regulus in the future here, coming up a couple of weeks. And Beehive is um, M44. Yeah. M44. <laughs> but here it's listed as NGC oh, something oh. 1632, I think. All right. You didn't include those. 2632. Okay. So but this is a different program, and I don't have as good a control over it as I did of the other one. I think we did a retrospective recently on the beehive. It's one busy looking, busy as bees, I guess. It's, it's a very close cluster. It's a big cluster. It's dramatic. Um, the stars are well separated and they're all in a 
image, you get it. some really nice bright stars. You can this see it naked Gemini eye up here. here. Bruce, what were you saying? I said you can see it naked eye in a dark sky. Right. Yeah, well, I keep my eyes closed. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> now, when we were one, about, down here uh, is Linden's star. Lighten's star. Mm -hmm. Oh. I've never I heard that before. Dutch. Lighten. Dutch. Is okay. there a man in it? <laughs> Okay. Well, the name is floating here. The nearest star to it is this one here. So maybe that's it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's one of those close uh, red dwarf stars. I'm not sure. It might be a okay. white dwarf. Okay. And what's the red right above where your pointer is? What's that red? Right this, there? One, this stuff? Yeah. That's um, NGC 2356. Um, Buster? 2355. Two, yeah. And it's another cluster? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, the um, galaxies in here are, have this symbol. Clusters have uh, the circle. But at one time, they thought everything was within reach of us. They're part of our galaxy here. There were no distant galaxies at one time, <laughs> what, 100 years ago? It was no, speculated that the blood. We're yeah, coming. The we're other coming. other galaxies, what we know now is other galaxies were, it was a debate up till the 1920s, um, whether they were things in our galaxy or they were other galaxies outside our galaxy. And Hubble resolved that by finding a Cepheid variable single star in Andromeda that gave us the first accurate, accurate distance measurement to that galaxy and clearly showed that it was well outside the Milky Way. And 2903 is a very bright galaxy at the front end of uh, Leo the Lion. It's easily seen in a six inch. Yeah, you're pointing out this one here. 20 yeah, 2903 yeah, galaxy. Yeah. It's very I, I, did a, I did a quick look up on Leighton Star, and it's a red dwarf. Okay. Okay. So it's probably not actually shown there, but yeah, that's where it is. That wouldn't be. Well, it's a got, very pale little limited magnitude set. There's a very pale little dot right above the L at about the 11 o'clock position. Yeah, that might be it. Right there? Huh. Or there. Let me, make this bigger. Let me go 500%. What era of history was old Charles Messier naming his hymns? Was that in the 18th or 19th centuries? Late 1700s, early 1800s. Right. So right. He, did, he didn't know about other galaxies, did he? That's no. correct. He just, but he did he know about uh, clusters? Did he think they were clusters or no? He thought he thought they were fuzzy things, fuzzy stars, mm -hmm. perhaps. Or okay, but got it. After him, were, right. people started making larger telescopes, especially Lord Ross and people. Mm -hmm. um, they thought that they they saw these things resolve into clusters, globular clusters and open clusters, and they assumed that everything that was fuzzy up there, if you blew it up, up big enough it would resolve into a cluster too, but they didn't. Well, here's a question you probably may or may not be able to answer. Uh, the distant galaxies do not stay as, they're not in sync with our stars. And we're turning in the galaxy, right? In the Milky Way. So within time, I'm wondering if they can measure it. Those suckers will kind of move out of the track. Do you hear what well, I'm saying? Why should that happen? Because they're not going around our center of the galaxy where they're not part of the stars the stars stay where they are because we're moving right around well yeah so the the dominant motion that you're going to see is all the stars moving in their own orbits at their own speeds okay so, so our, all our right. stars are going to change position much more than the galaxies are right yes. oh i see okay but still there'd be a change i mean it's unlike uh, planets planets we know move fast enough. They, they are so far away in general that you're not going to see a change caused by that ah okay there's a few yeah. stars that we can see change over a few years like mm -hmm. barnard's star and there's a mm -hmm. couple of other ones too that are moving and some of them are moving against the motion of our galaxy wow yeah piazzi's flying star that's yeah, that's another one. Arcturus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Binaries are us. Well, we got plenty to talk about as far as different, um, what are they, um, variables. I think 
Ron, I yeah. think you can take a medicine for this condition. <laughs> <laughs> I see it. Yeah, I've got a scar on the back of my leg. It looks just like that. <laughs> I'm treating it with antiseptic. But that's a mon somewhere, right? Oh, the, the volcanoes. This is Olympus Mons on Mars. Okay, that's one of the two planets. And if you've got a growth that looks like that on your leg, use 5 fluorouracil on it. It'll go away. It'll oh, fall off. Okay, that's, that's Olympus Mons, all 15 miles high or something like that. It's one and a half times higher, or two and a half times higher than uh, Everest in the U in the Earth. But, but there's no act. There, are there active volcanoes on Mars that are spewing lava right now? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, so you could probably say there's a lot more than just four uh, objects in the solar system that had volcanic. Uh, hell these, are these are volcanoes on four objects. There's uh, Venus is conspicuously out of this list. But there's right. no good visible pictures of it. You do it by radar. And as we discussed earlier, there is um, out an early one of our talks, there is a volcano on Venus that is changing shape. So it's assumed to be uh, active. Ooh. And there are plenty of cryovolcanoes out there, too, if you can. Yeah, we'll get to like a the one on series. But the four you mentioned in your talking notes are uh, the one we're seeing now, Mars, and Io, the moon of Jupiter, and Ceres, which is yeah. the dwarf planet in the asteroid belt, making it an asteroid, and then little Pluto. Yeah. So the four. And I guess we're going to go to all four of them here. And there's, yeah, there's also, you know, Europa and um, okay, well, Enceladus. They even when they're spewing ice instead of lava, they're they're considered volcanic? It's Still cryovolcanism. Counts. That's what you have on Ceres. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's got to be incredible. I suppose anything has both <laughs> ice jets in. No, that can't be done, can they? Well, you might. But did it, was it Cassini that saw? No, uh, Cassini was around... Saturn, but it was Voyager that's uh the IO ones, the spray. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, yeah, but they were predicted by Stanton Peel out at UCSB even before yeah. they were seen. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is called a shield volcano. We have examples on Earth, mm -hmm. but it's uh, this is the outflow and the cone from the volcano itself, and it's a, a basically a, a basalt, just like many of Earth's volcanoes. But it's well, not think, active presently. I think yeah. I read somewhere that the edge, that ragged, almost round edge that we're looking at, is actually like cliffs themselves. You're yeah. walking across the plain, and it's suddenly a mile high cliff. Yeah, it jumps up. Wow! And well, then that's... it's then it's a real shallow, uh, gentle curve up to the top. You don't think we could land a rover somewhere on that gentle curve? Uh. <laughs> probably could if you really wanted to probably not worth the risk given the expense yeah i'm not sure that there's much look worth looking at on there there's probably no life up there but unlike a crater from an impact a uh, volcano extinct like this that stopped doesn't have the little bump in the middle of the crater does it no it has a hole in the middle mm -hmm. yeah okay well, and you can see there are a couple the of asteroid impacts on it there yeah oh. There, okay. there. The molten lava shrinks as it uh, as the volcano goes dormant. Wow. And there are other monsters too, I assume, around Mars. Not there are. One. Okay. Wow. Well, that's Io. This, this oh, place okay. is, yeah, this is Io. And we definitely have a um, active volcano here spewing on the horizon. Uh, these are fairly low temperature materials. And the thing driving it is internal grinding from tidal forces from two other moons that are near Io, Europa and uh, Ganymede. I thought it was Jupiter. No, Jupiter uh, is not the driver of this. Oh, uh, really? Jupiter is farther it, away. It contributes, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So I thought it had a, an elliptical orbit, which allowed Jupiter to massage it. Ah, 
elliptical orbits kind of uh, uh, do away with tidally locked, or is this tidally locked? No, the moon no, is an elliptical orbit. Locked. Locked. You know, again. gravity goes as the inverse square uh, of the product of the two masses of the objects. And if you're in an elliptical orbit, you're the, the moon is changing direction. I'm sorry, distance from the parent yeah. star or parent planet, I should say. So the um, force of gravity is it's going up and down and up and down. It gets massaged. Okay. So that creates, that's the transfer of energy and it keeps it hot. Well, yeah, it's it like taking a rubber ball and then just continually squeezing it and squeezing it and squeezing it. And after a while, it feels, feels warm to you. But now this is the <laughs> internal inter friction. Is this the innermost moon of Jupiter? Yes, it is. Is it most of the big moon? I, I think Jerry should yes. publish. You should publish that, Jerry. <laughs> publish what? What you just said about a ball. Oh, <laughs> I think I read it somewhere. Oh, well, I, to I totally understand that concept. I'm just uh, very dim on, on tidally locked, which our moon is, and it's, what, quarter of a million miles away. Most, yeah. most moons in the solar system are. That's Out because their center of mass and their center of rotation are not in the same place. Right. But my question is, is this one being the innermost, is it as far away from Jupiter as our moon is away from us, and therefore oh, is that? It I don't know. I think it's at roughly the same. It's at on the order of 200,000 miles out, yes. So it's it's on the it's order of our moon from us. Well, it looks like a pizza I tried to make once. Nobody would eat it. <laughs> it would probably smell bad. It <laughs> smelled horrible. <laughs> These are all sulfur. Should have let Tom Whittemore make it. Right. You ever made a pizza, Tom? Yeah, I'd make wonderful margaritas. Margarita pizza. Just Margarita. a simple pizza. Yeah, the simplest uh, pizza. Just, you know, basil, tomato sauce, and some cheese. And That's salt it. around salt around the edge, right, the rim? <laughs> no, no, I'm talking about pizza. <laughs> so <laughs> Io completes two orbits of Jupiter for every one orbit of Europa and four orbits of Jupiter for every one orbit of Ganymede. So Io frequently lines up with, with one of these other moons and is stretched between Jupiter and that moon. And that's where you get the energy for this uh, these volca internal volcanoes. And because they're kind of in integer ratio orbits, um, that's a regular squeezing that happens. It doesn't yeah. doesn't change uh, tempo, so you you get this heating. But Europa is the moon that's giving us all the hope, isn't it? Well, Europa gives us water, spews water. It's totally opposite Io. It's yeah. frozen yeah. hell. Now, well, I was also, I was also um, going through Japan, uh, Jupiter's radiation belts. So okay. it even on occasion generates um, auroras in the, the moon's thin atmosphere. Do you suppose there's hot lava always on its surface everywhere? Pretty much is that what we're looking at here? Yeah, in quite a few spots. Yeah, it's the hottest spot outside of the sun in the solar system. Wow. Hmm. Now I had a video clip of it, but I can't get the video clip to play here. So just imagine this is all in motion. Well, what would it have shown in motion? Moving or the spout? No, not the no, it would have shown this thing up here. Oh. You can actually see the stuff moving and the stuff spitting out and stuff. Who, who, who's it? Who was what's what's that? That? What Shakespearean character or p person from ancient Greece is Io named after? Does anybody know? The moons of Jupiter are named after the lovers of Jupiter. Oh, he had a lot of lovers. He was quite a swinger. Here we are. It looks like a shell, like a yeah. lip. This, it does. Like a this sand is, um, This is ice. Oh. And uh, this is the Ahunamans. Uh, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, Ahuna Mons on the on the dwarf planet Ceres in the asteroid belt. Okay. There's also at another place on the Ceres, there's a very, very bright spot in a crater that um, even though you can't resolve it, you it's a dominant feature for as you get approach Ceres from far away, seeing the bright spot. And it is the, the bright spot and other bright things, white things around on the moon or on this dwarf planet are deposits of um, salts. 
uh, from uh, the salty water inside. So Ceres is believed to have a large ocean inside of its, uh, inside the body of the, of the planet. Otherwise that's a dead volcano. There's no evidence yet. We have limited looks at it. It's four kilometers high. So it's quite high. It's made of um, uh, uh, carbonate salts. And it is an example of cryovolcanism, liquid salty water. Oh. Hmm. So this is the nearest known cryovolcano to the sun. And it's the only dwarf planet in the asteroid belt. Yes. So far. Does it not have little asteroid moons going around it? No, it doesn't. Wow. Some a little this, smaller ones. Go ahead. This one is a close-up of Pluto. Ooh. And this, this is a cryovolcano also. This is, of course, much farther away. It's about 150 kilometers across and, again, four kilometers high. Wow. And it spews liquid nitrogen, right? This is the Wright Mons, W-I-R-T, and let's see. Um, I believe you're right, but I don't see that word here. Liquid nitrogen? Is that what you said? Right. Yeah, the, there's a lot of things here that are solid nitrogen. If well, this would... were closer to the sun, a lot of this surface that you see would become atmosphere. Well, that big white heart shape is all nitrogen, isn't it? On Pluto? Yes, it's a big plane of nitrogen. The average temperature on the surface of Pluto is minus 230 degrees Celsius. Well, I get that in my fridge. <laughs> That's about 40 degrees above absolute zero. Mm -hmm. Can I have it clarified? There's a smudge in the middle, almost in the middle, just to the right of uh, the left of the middle. Is that it? What? No, it's. That's this hole is the oh, cryovolcano. Okay, got it. This is the effluent from that, I assume. Okay, got it. Wow. But it would be safe to say that the only active lava-type volcanic places are uh, us and, and Venus and Io. Everything else is either dead or ice, right? Well, depending on how you define it, there are several moons of Jupiter and Saturn that spew geysers of liquid water from inside. I'm not sure the geysers are uh, qualify as volcanoes, but they're doing the same thing. They're spewing out jets of salty water. Yes, but as far as rocks, yes. But, but is there anything in common with those things in Old Faithful and Yellowstone? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. It's similar. That's geothermal heating going on and spewing it up. So the water would be hot? Well, relative to the ice, yeah. In uh, Yellowstone, the uh, water is definitely hot. Scalding, it kills people. Okay. And animals, too. They stink. Yeah. Wow. Well, I wonder why it's an hourly. That. They've got to go and drag them out because they've turned into a stew. Yeah, one guy dove in or fell in or something, and it was difficult to get. So he went back the next morning to get him, and he'd been dissolved. Mm -hmm. Woo! Hell of a way to go. Yeah. Yeah, and one guy, all that was left was a sneaker with a foot in it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it are we talking about faithful, old faithful? Well, uh, similar things. The well, We're talking about you know a, a, a pool, not a not a geyser. Yeah. Oh, I see. One of those pools. Right. Well, did, did you ever hear about the college pranksters, the kids that drove up in the car right before all the tourists were waiting for? <laughs> oh, yeah. And they jumped out, opened the trunk, took out a huge key and stabbed it into the ground, looked at their watch, said, OK, let her go. And they turned the key and it took off. <laughs> that was a um, that was a um, you're on camera. camera skit. Yeah. Right. And it, it was, was a big, 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 like a, a big, big valve, valve wheel. Yeah. Right. Oh, and God. one lady went up to the ranger and complained. She said, you told me this was all natural. And he says, it is. <laughs> she said, well, what are these guys doing here? And he says, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling off a prank. What yeah. do you call a deer with no eyes? I, uh, no idea. No idea. <laughs> well, I apologize for the fuzziness of this one. 
This is the summer triangle here, and it's rising in the east. This is in the east. Um, and it consists of, dang, I depend on reading these things later. That's Altair down there. Oh, Altair's yeah. down. It rises there nearly east. Altair. Yeah, this is Altair. Vega this, up top. Yeah, mm -hmm. Vega and Deneb yeah. over yeah. here. So it's rising in the morning. This is um, this is well. It's rising in the late evening. This is eleven o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Any time this week. So uh, in the morning, two o'clock or something, it'll be right overhead. Three o'clock. So it's and it's covering a very uh, rich part. The summer um, Milky okay. Way that is loaded with um, nebulous and star clusters. Mm -hmm. Is it an asterism, Mr. President? Yes. It's a pattern of stars, and so it is an asterism. Mm -hmm. well, it's something that's easy to spot. And these stars are so bright that in a poor sky, you're going to easily see this, imagine this triangle. Yeah. In a really dark sky with everything, all the stars and stuff visible, this will fade away. Right. And Ron, this is a case where the asterism shared by three different constellations. Oh, that's the reason. Because well, you could have an asterism within a constellation. This is just one that's shared by three constellations. So there's lots, lots, lots of different kinds of asterisms, and you can go out tonight if it's clear, and you can make up your <laughs> <Right>. own. <laughs> well, you can also make infinite number of triangles. Any three stars will make a triangle. These three make that one because of their brightness. Is that what it is? Yeah, they're bright. Yeah, they're, they're very bright. prominent. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're saying, Tom, that each one of those stars is in a different constellation? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. wow. Altair is in the eagle, Dana is in the, in the swan, and then Vega is in the harp. Well, now, in the southern hemisphere, Australia gets, what, it's crossed, right? They, they don't have a triangle. They have a teeny little southern cross. It's not a dramatic <laughs> constellation. It's the smallest constellation of all. It's a cross, though. It's uh, five or six or four. How many stars are in the cross down there? Four. four? Five, I think. That one, of, one of them, there's a pair on one side. Has to mm. have to have one in the middle to make it. <laughs> no, it Excuse doesn't me. have one in the middle. It doesn't? Mm -hmm. And they call it a cross instead of a box or a square. Mm -hmm. Okay. Catching up here. Okay. Wow. So I, I got, uh, we got an, a call from my daughter on Saturday that she had to go to work. And so we raced down there to babysit my grandson. And so oh. I used different software on a different computer <laughs> to generate this stuff. Oh, oh. And I see it was a disaster. A good test, good test run for the Tesla. Oh, yeah. Tesla does one great. One charge got you there. Huh? So... This right. is the locator for M27, which is right there. But it doesn't help because you can't see any of the other stuff around it for go to. So we'll go directly to M27. That's big enough. And that's a favorite of Chuck's. He always makes a comment about this. It's named after me. <laughs> is this the dumbbell? Yep. Yeah. yeah I really seven. prefer the Apple Core nebula. <laughs> yeah, I think I do too. It certainly looks like that. Yeah, well, but this is a planetary down. nebula, and the white dwarf is right there in the middle. And okay. this is the stuff that it threw, has thrown off. If you take a really long exposure, exposure, you find all sorts of stuff way out here that's much, much fainter. So it's been sloughing stuff off for quite a while before it did its conversion to a white dwarf. We take a long exposure, huh? Exposure, <laughs> right. Exposure, that's what you said. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so M25, what are we looking at then? A M27. Oh, M27. Uh, so it's yeah, in the constellation of... And the reason I can keep those oh. apart or in order is dumbbell is lower in the alphabet than um, <laughs> ring. Okay, well, on my notes, I have the RCB, that's our Coronae Borealis, followed by the cataclysmic VO4. Oh, that's coming up next. Let me just <laughs> give you a rundown on the Messier 27. 
Yeah. This is uh, in Cygnus, Ron. It's in Cygnus. This con yeah, this is in uh, Volpecula at a distance of about oh, 13, okay. 1,360 light years. Um, it's the first such nebula to be discovered by Charles Messier in 1764. It's uh, at visual magnitude seven and a half. So it's an easy object in a small telescope. You'll never see it with your naked eye. And it's a diameter of about eight arc minutes. So it's quite small. And in, in most telescopes, you pass right over it and think it was a star. And it's visible in binoculars or small telescopes. It's a good object that we show when it's up at our outreaches. Now, moving on to Corona Borealis. Our Corona Borealis. RCB, variables, an eruptive, speaking of yeah. volcanism. It's an erupting variable. Erupting this variable. Is, this is a visual light curve that's shown, taken by uh, an amateur and posted on Facebook starting in 2015. The uh, time down here are, it's JDs at the bottom down here, which are Julian dates, which count the days. 2,458.888 or 2,000 or something. Can't seems like it. yesterday, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> seems like it. So anyway, um, it was discovered by Edward Pigot in 1795, who observed the first enig enig enigmatic fadings of the star. There's about 150 RCB type stars in our galaxy, but modeling of uh, stellar evolution predict about a thousand. So there's we're missing about um, ninety percent of the stars that we think should be there, which means that we need to rethink our calculations. Um, yeah. May I point something out, Jerry? For Ron, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, the y-axis, Ron, is give, given in you know visual magnitude, and notice from the bottom to the top, yeah. there's about a difference of eight. Okay, a difference of eight. Then uh, that translates to a huge number because this is basic, based on logarithms. Uh, a difference of five is a factor of 100 in brightness, okay? So a difference of eight is probably about 600 times. I'm just kind of guessing, okay? It's, it's huge, it's huge. So this is quite a burst. Well, it also is based on hydrogen deficiency. The, uh, the star itself is considered, is modeled as, and from a spectroscopic analysis, it's a rare hydrogen deficient, deficient and carbon rich supergiant stars. Wow. Um, these are the product of the mergers of white dwarfs yeah. in the mass range between 0.6 to 1.2, our solar mass. Mm -hmm. So one of them. Um, so you can think of this as sort of a failed type 1a supernova. Mm -hmm. This that's when that's that can happen when two white dwarfs merge and their mass goes above a critical level. Yeah. Another little tidbit for Ron. So when you start naming or cataloging variable stars and constellations, this one's in Corona Borealis. You see it's R, letter R. That's the first one cataloged. They start out R S T U V. That's how it goes. So and, this and is capital, the capital letters. Yeah, capital R. Mm -hmm. That R doesn't stand for anything. Nobody's name or it's the first one cataloged in this constellation. They they started with R. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's crazy, isn't it? But that's what that's what we do in astronomy. <laughs> well, it's similar to magnitude and uh, uh, the difference between Cepheids. I totally don't have that yet, but I'm working on yeah. it. Cepheids versus these other variables, they all do the same thing, don't they? Just no, not a regular. No, no, a lot of these a lot of these naming formats come from um, empirical knowledge or yep. observations without much understanding of what they mean physically. And then the physics is added later so that they take like stellar um, surface temperature, you know, they were labeled alphabetically. And then they found out that the real meaning was it was just to take the O, M, um, O, B, F, G and stuff out of, out of it and throw all the rest away. So you get some of these odd yeah. things like that. Another little point that I mentioned for Ron here is that uh, the 14, you see Ron, the 14 down there on the lower left. Yeah. That's kind of like the brightness of Pluto. There's no way you can see it without a big scope. But if you go and see where it tops out, it's around magnitude six. That's, that's you know, visible to the naked eye in a good, good sky. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's so basically over it disappeared right? and all of a sudden it's there, kind of. Now, what's happening here is that the thing is cruising along and it's got dust around it, which gets blown away. Mm -hmm. And then it builds up enough hydrogen on the surface that it blows up. And then it's, and that dust from the blow up obscures it. And then it, as the dust dissipates, it, it comes back to full brightness again. Wow. And it does this periodically every 157 days, I think. Okay. On the, on the extreme just, right, is it about to plunge again? Yeah. Yes, that's what the quest, that's what the, this guy published it and says, are we about to see another plunge? I see. Wow. So it's, about as, it's about as bright as it ever gets. Is this the one that does it over about a, one of our years or is it many years? No, that's that's oh. Myra. Oh, that's the yeah. oh, okay. We'll, we'll get to we'll get to Myra in a bit. Oh, that's right. <laughs> well, what does okay. it have to what what does it have to do with our uh, uh, northern lights? The name Borealis. Nothing. That means <laughs> north, Ron. Yeah. Oh, is that what it means? <laughs> yeah, Australis is south. And R is just a way of just designating. It doesn't stand. Yeah, just catalog how to ca catalog it. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, there's a bunch of them, and they're called RCBs, or at least the bunch is 150 that we know about, and there's the other 90 percent we can't see or find. Well, <laughs> some guy named Edward Pigott did this Pichot? right when we were starting our nation. I, I'm I sure think it's Pichot. Pichot. Yeah. I think it's Pichot. Oh, Pichot? This drop, going back, just one comment. This drop in brightness is the same um, dust dimming that. Betelgeuse is going through when it throws out a lot of plumes of dust and stuff and obscures itself for a while. So then when when the, um, two white dwarf stars are very close to each other and they accumulate hydrogen on the surface and they blow up, it's like a periodic nova. That's what this uh, VO442 Centaurus is doing. Mm. VO442, what is it? Is that another categorizing system we should know about, VO? Yes. Okay. It comes in a bottle. <laughs> Eo, right. <laughs> so this is uh, going between um, 12th magnitude, which is already dim, yeah. and going down to 16 and a half magnitude, which is very dim. Mm -hmm. So um, it would need, for my stuff, I would need to um, take time exposure of it mm -hmm. to get it. Now, this is that star when it's at its minimum brightness. Okay. Wow. And this this is the star when it's at its maximum brightness. Yeah. That's a big scope, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, this is a big scope. <laughs> but we're talking a binary, right? A white dwarf orbiting a red two dwarf. White dwarfs, two white dwarfs. Two white dwarfs. Two white. stars close together, one peeling hydrogen off the other. Your, your notes said one's a white, the other's a red. Yeah, that's what, yeah. Okay. The red would be the source of the hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Right. Why? What's because white dwarfs don't wouldn't have a lot of it in their atmosphere. Plus, they hold on to their atmosphere a lot tighter. Okay, red doesn't connote age. They're running yeah. down their surface temperature. Surface temperature mm -hmm. only. Okay. So. Um, so this one has a periodic explosions between one hundred and twenty and one hundred and fifty days. Oh, jeez. Uh, that's half a year. Mm -hmm. How big a scope would you need to be able to see this? I could I could take pictures like that with a probably a yeah. twelve inch. Okay, yeah. I could I get can, a twenty four inch at Westmont with, with a camera. That would be that would be overkill. <laughs> yeah, with a, with a, with a with the video cam that I do um, occultations with, with just a five inch scope, I can reach all, just about fifteen. That's amazing. Okay. Well, are these categorized as cataclysmic variables? Or this just... one is, I think it's called a recurring nova. Okay. Yeah, it's a cataclysmic variable mm -hmm. of the SS Cygni type. So we, we wouldn't want to be orbiting one of those stars, would we? We wouldn't be orbiting one of those stars. <laughs> <laughs> what is SS Cygni? That's another one oh. in Cygnus. Okay. It's the first one they found that does this kind of periodic blowing up. Yeah. And it's it's a cataloging that's that's deep into the catalog because yeah. 
you have to go through the alphabet, you know, R, S, T, U, V, then you come back and you pick up uh, another letter. So the SS tells me that it's deep in the catalog, which is yeah. deep. But VO442 is not also an M and a, a CV gene or GV, what the hell is that other one? Well, Ron, it's it's in a variable star catalog, and that's its designation in that catalog. Right, right. But, but Messier didn't see it, or it wasn't big enough. No, no, no. Oh, he couldn't see that. <laughs> oh, you need it's to too darn dim. Okay, gotcha. Right. Cataclysmic variables. That sounds exciting. Now, this, now, this one is um. Well. Uh, this one is a variable star, Myra. It's represented by the red down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's in the early morning just before sunrise. This is the constellation of Cetus. And you can see Pisces up there. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a star in the con that contributes to the asterism of uh, Cetus. Mm -hmm. It yeah. is the AAVSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers, featured variable for October. So we're jumping ahead a little. This is coming up just before sunrise. But by October, it will be well suited for a comfortable observation around midnight or late evening. Nice. But won't be as bright as it is now. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. That's the one that translates to wonderful. Wunderbar. Wunderbar. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm waiting for us to get to categorizing exoplanets, and we only have about nine minutes. But uh... Okay. Well, we'll go right to so that uh, one thing you won't see about... Um, Myra is that it has a famous tail, but you have to photograph it to see the tail. Myra and the debris it's leaving as it's traveling through the galaxy. Wow. Really? That's, that's really beautiful. Stars do that. Wow. Okay, here we go. The four categories. Okay. Read them and weep. Similar, mixed, uh, anti-ordered, and ordered. And we're... Yes, yeah, so it's a statistical survey of all known exoplanet systems have classed them as being one of these four types of star systems. We're the fourth at the bottom. This is from um, the More University of Bern. Yeah, we're the, we're the ordered. Yep. Although if you look at Uranus and Neptune, they're smaller than Jupiter and Saturn. So it's generally <laughs> ordered. Yeah. Yes, okay. Roughly yes. ordered. This is not but common. These com yeah, least common. Yeah, wow. Maybe it's part and parcel. Every time we every time we see something about our solar system or our planet, it's least common. So yeah. it tells me that the situation for our life here is very least common, <laughs> at least least to the cube power common. <laughs> so it's very difficult. You can't just find a planet in the Goldilocks zone. That's only one of the terms. But none of this can be classified with the Drake equation either yet. It's no, no, this is this this is partially defining one of the terms of the Drake equation. Wow. <clears throat> but in our uh, solar system, Venus is about the same size as Earth, mm -hmm. and Mars is smaller. Yeah. Yeah. No, this this is you can't look too much at detail. This is these are general classifications. It doesn't mean that everything is going to fit rigidly into these. Wow. How many 5,000 they've classified, they've found? Somewhere in that. Uh, yeah, there's, there's five we're in excess 000. of 5,000. 5,000 exoplanets. Yeah. Um, we're counting. I wonder what's the most, the, would the similar be the most common? Uh, some of those stars or stellar systems that, that are just lined up, they're all exactly the same, like the top line. Yeah, there. there's oh. a, one of them, the Glaza, has, has this pattern. Um, so does and I think they, the they, they, they tried to name uh, the planets after the seven dwarves and then add the eighth one as the last one or something. <laughs> they they were all similar. Really? Well, is is it fair to say that anything large is going to be a gas planet, and those small ones are going to be rocky like us and Mars? In general. I think I suspect that's probably a general generalization that's closer to true than not. But oh, the thing that strikes me about this is that I've read a number of articles about planets, planetary systems not really being stable over the long term. And so you've come up with some of these things where 
the giant, you got a hot giant in the anti-order thing, and it's going around the sun, its sun every few days or something. But And it turns out that our system may have started with a hot Jupiter and it moved out to where it is now. Now, those are all speculation because people set up models and then they play with the models and they see where it goes. So it doesn't mean that any of those model starting points was actually ever a realistic starting point. But it's but, interesting. But the nice, the nice model that seems to do really well has Jupiter and Saturn forming fairly far out, but then migrating in and out because of gas friction with the uh, with the nebula that they're in, you know, forming from. Yeah. And tossing other tossing things around. So well, there's some common sense things you can think about that make sense. Uh, anything that large that's made of gas, is, if it's close up, uh, it's gonna, the gas is going to be blown away by the, the stellar... Not necessarily. Not if you got strong enough gravity, if you're big. Besides, you're, you're uh, again thinking that uh, you're under what's called STP, standard temperature and pressure, and it's a gas under that. But on these planets, gases like hydrogen can be solids. And they can be um, crystalline solids. They can be metals. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, is there if it's a crystalline solid? It would be a metal. Is there a theory that uh, Mercury might have been a gas giant at one time, and it's no. you know, bare no. ass? No, uh, not a gas no, giant. Not it... Okay, go ahead, Chuck. Not a gas giant. It may have had more of an atmosphere when it had, uh, you know, when it okay. wasn't as. Well, it, it, when it was initially forming, but that all got scoured away. Yeah. Mercury is an oddity in that it has a very large uh, iron-rich core and fairly thin crust and mantle. So it could be the res result of something that collided. It's more of the core of something. But And, and it, it, it formed in an area where gas would have been driven away early, so it didn't have time to accrete a whole lot of it. Right. But as far as life is concerned, it's Goldilocks zone. You know, liquid water is the key, no matter as long as plus For life like us. Yeah. Plus, uh, life probably wouldn't evolve even in the Goldilocks zone on a gas giant with all that turbulence. And no, the um, the turbulence that gives these volcanoes and geysers on moons of Jupiter and Saturn, there's um liquid water underneath that. So it's not in the Goldilocks zone from heating from the sun, but it does heat internally from tidal forces. And there's the possibility, it's been speculated that there could be basic life on those uh, moons. And and that's an energy source, you know, and that's right. what life wants. Yeah, I mean, just like Titan, the, Titan the, you've got minus 300 degrees, but you, you've got a whole sort of a hydro system with liquid methane being vapor and solid and liquid. And so you could you could have a life chemistry based on that. Should be totally unlike us. Yeah. Sure. I mean, well, the, well, water... the, tube, <clears throat> the tube worms that they found at the bottom of the ocean, they live on uh, sulfur. There's right. no oxygen down there. Yeah. Ke chem chemical heat rather than heat from the sun out here. Right. Well, this is fascinating. Just four. They'll probably come up with a fifth or a sixth strange array. <laughs> None of the above, I think it's called. <laughs> Have they found any moons orbiting exoplanets? Can they There are a couple of suspected exomoons. I don't know that they've proved it yet. Okay, but we probably know that there are moons everywhere. There's probably more moons than anything else, except maybe asteroids. This is fascinating stuff, gentlemen. You got through all of it except the double ring galaxy, which has a strange acronym accompanying it. APOD. I don't know what that would. Oh, there That's it is. That's astronomy photo the, of the day, Ron. Day. Oh, yeah. okay. Got this it. is their right now. This is um, a galaxy with a ring. The hypothesis is that this was a barred spiral, but then the the bar um, became a spiral and had a burst of star formation in it that uh, created the inner galaxy. That's a galaxy we're looking at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God, it, okay. Looks like uh, something part of a Lucky Strike commercial. It's yeah. not big. It's about 45,000 light years across, and it's 15 million light years away. 
My yeah. old man Messier gave it 94. Yeah. He just saw it as a as a possible comet, a blurb. Constellation Canis Fenachiti, the hunting dogs. That's yeah. The There's other little galaxies in the right. background. Yeah, I was about to uh, mention that. There. 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 Well, that's there. going to be my favorite galaxy, just because it's so odd and unusual. Uh -huh. No orbiting? It's Is it possible that a, a galaxy doesn't turn at all? Everything's turning. You that's know? not likely, yeah. Yeah. yeah, getting rid of all the angular momentum is tough. Well, yes, it is. And it's always hard to close these because I just get fascinated to tell. And I know you guys enjoy it. And we keep rejoining ourselves as talking heads on the screen as we age gracefully and keep getting aged out of watching the star at star parties. We're getting sick. Yeah. I have a feeling you're going to have plenty of bright skies, gentlemen, later in the summer, you know, late July, August. Even just September. later this week. I yeah. hope so. Fiesta brings on the hot, and and so anything we've got scheduled, you can tell us about real quick, uh, Chuck. Uh, Bacara on Thursday, Westmont on Friday, Refugio on Saturday. <laughs> and okay, okay, we'll, out. we'll talk to you next week. We'll do number one hundred twenty-two. Thank you on behalf of the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. I'm Baron, and the rest of you, thank you, and give my love to your.